You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the Unsolved Colonial Parkway Murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. So lots of great news this week in true crime. We thought we'd start off with some outstanding news in a very sad case. In 1974, a five-year-old girl named Shabon McGinnis was raped and murdered and her body discarded in a drainage ditch outside of town of Missoula, Montana. And the case has gone unsolved for 46 years. A terrific thing happened this week. Othram conducted full genome sequencing on the available DNA evidence, which had been well-preserved over 46 years. And despite the fact that there was a very small amount, they were actually able to come up with a profile, and a suspect has been identified. The FBI did the forensic genealogy research required to identify the suspect. He is deceased but he has been identified. And a very nice thing has happened as well, which is uh, this suspect, Davis is his last name, um, has been identified. And the families of the little girl, Siobhan McGinnis, and Mr. Davis have had contact. And apparently those conversations have gone very well. Richard Davis's family has been understanding and they were very open to confirming and working with the investigators in Missoula, Montana and the FBI to confirm that their DNA was a match. Her father, Shaban's father, who's now in his late 70s, was extremely eloquent and thoughtful about what it's like to wait 46 years for answers in your five-year-old girl's unsolved murder. It was a very, very striking case. Outstanding work, and uh, we love seeing results like that. And congratulations to our friends at Othram for the excellent work that they continue to do. And we should mention that Othram are sponsors of our podcast, and we are happy to continue working with them moving forward, bringing their cases to light and helping to celebrate their successes as well. We have some excellent news in the case of Brianna Maitland. Brianna's case was covered by Paul Holes and Billy Jensen of the Murder Squad, and they did announce that they would be covering the balance of the cost for the DNA testing by Othram Labs. So at this point, with the help of Paul and Billy and their generosity, the cost of Brianna's DNA testing has been fully funded, and our thanks go out to Paul and Billy for helping to reach the remainder of that balance. Thanks to all of you for your contributions to that $5,000 goal, and so that testing will proceed, and we hope to have results by the end of the year. Remember, there are no guarantees. They may or may not be able to identify a perpetrator or whoever is the supplier of the DNA. Hope springs eternal. We're very excited to be starting a new series on the Brianna Maitland case with a two-part interview with her father, Bruce Maitland. We intend to explore this case on an in-depth basis and see if we can bring something new to the conversation about what happened to Brianna Maitland who disappeared 16 years ago in northern Vermont. It's a very baffling case and an interesting case. This lovely 17-year-old girl disappeared and has never been heard from again. Many experts feel that this could be a solvable case with a fresh set of eyes and new attention, as well as the new testing that Othram is conducting. So here is part one of our interview with Bruce Maitland, father of Brianna Maitland. Thank you so much for listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. Joining us today is Bruce Maitland. He is the father of Brianna Maitland and also the founder of Private Investigations for the Missing. Very impressive guy, someone that we've been following for a number of years, and we're thrilled to have him here on Mind Over Murder. Bruce, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. We're glad to have you, too. 
funny. I feel like I've gotten to know you a little bit better because I watched your discussion last evening on Crawl Space. They do a thing on Get Vocal where there's actually a visual component. And it was fun to listen to your observations and to be able to see you. I know in this example, we're just going to have to go audio only. If you would, Bruce, tell us the basic facts of Brianna's case for those listeners that might not be as familiar with the case. Well, the the basic fact is uh, Brianna was working uh, part-time at a bed and breakfast establishment called the Black Lantern Inn uh, up in Montgomery, Vermont, which is a a little ski village that kind of sits at the foot of uh, Jay Peak up in the northern Green Mountains. And she was working as a dishwasher at the time. On March 19th, which was a Friday night, after work was over, she was seen getting in her car in the parking lot and leaving the parking lot. And then about a mile away on her way back from that place, her car was found bashed into, backed into exactly uh, the side of an abandoned building. You know, the car was backed up at a rate of speed enough to clear the foundation of the building and then actually looked like it got hung up on the building itself by the back bumper. And no one has seen or heard of Brianna ever since. So the car, from the photographs, it's a kind of a big full-size Oldsmobile, mid-80s type car, if I'm not mistaken. This isn't something that would happen as a result of an accident. I mean, this looks like somebody really made an effort to take that car and smack it into what looks like almost like a um, a barn or something. Yes. Well, it, it was an old abandoned house that had been abandoned for many years. And uh, there's no doubt that the car was actually driven past the house and then for some reason stopped on the road and was backed into that building. Yeah. There's uh, The car was either... Either something happened earlier that made that that made another person back that car in there, uh, maybe in an effort to hide the car temporarily or something like that. Or Brianna herself may have backed the car in there thinking that she was trying to get out of some kind of emergency and maybe just didn't realize that the building was there. Everything being dark. Right. So, uh, no one really knows for sure. And weather conditions, I mean, it's March, it's Vermont. Was there snow on the ground, that kind of thing? Uh, yes, I think there was a dusting of snow on the ground, and, and there may it may have been some snow that night, freezing rain, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But this is definitely not a traffic accident or a- a- anything no. close to that. That's correct. And yes. are there any signs uh, of violence or, or any sense of, of her being attacked or somehow taken away from the car? Uh, I, I think there was there was a number of smaller items that were kind of outside the car. And so and the doors were open in the car by the first passer buyer that saw it and the lights were still on. So I take that as signs that something happened there. Uh, in my own mind, I think, you know, she was probably pulled out of that car at that point, some kind of struggle or something. Uh, you know, there's no other explanation in my mind what, you know, why there should be stuff kind of scattered around the ground there. So was this treated as a missing persons case at first? How was this classified? Uh, well, there was kind of unusual circumstances that, uh, they didn't, uh, they initially treated it as a missing persons case. However, uh, they really treated it as a runaway case. The state police did for the first uh, for the first few days. There's just no real explanation for them treating that by the evidence that was there. It, it was sort of, I think, just a pre kind of a presupposition on their their part that you know, oh well, this is just a young girl. She probably ran away. Right. They kind of blew it off right away. You know, initially. And Brianna was living on her own at this point and working at the Black Lantern Inn and finishing up her GED. So the running away thing, it's not like she was living at home with her mom and dad at that point. I'm a little lost as to why the the Vermont State Police would classify her as a runaway. What's she supposed to be running away from? Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you, you know, it's funny because a lot of times when you hear about, you know, 17 year old young person, quote, running away, they're usually running away from parental pressure or family issues and that sort of thing. And she wasn't living at this point with you and her mom. And she was kind of striking out on her own, would, wouldn't you say? 
Yes. I mean, Brianna, Brianna, I, I've kind of described her as, I mean, she was 17 going on 25 <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she just was an incredibly just a free spirit and, uh, you know, was just, uh, actually, you know, kind of capable person. And, and she just kind of up and decided that, uh, you know, well, you know, I'm, and, and I, I guess to, to put a little bit of clarity to, uh, just in a, in a sense of a family history. I mean, I, I was at that time kind of a, a back, a back to the lander. If right. You remember that right. from the seventies. I just did it a number of years late. Right. Uh, it, well, expl- uh, explain that for, for folks that might not be familiar with, uh, with that movement. Well, it was just kind of a, to li- to live a very sustainable lifestyle. I was a consulting forester at the time that that's how I made my living. And, uh, I, I did some logging in the woods and different things like that. And, uh, it, we just got really interested in, in living that real sustainable lifestyle. And we had actually had an old farmstead in Vermont and we kind of took the next step. And I bought a large piece of land that was a mile in the woods, long, long driveway. Uh, we made our own power. You know, we lived, we lived off the grid. Wow. Uh, you guys were like trendsetters. Because this is very big. Well, this is very big now. Again, here it is, you know, some years later. Yes. It's kind of had a little bit of a resurgence for sure. Right. It's not quite as rugged as people might think. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of technology involved in it. And if you set up your place, right, you know, you, you can live a pretty comfortable lifestyle, but it wasn't, it wasn't a very good lifestyle that Brianna was happy with. You know, I have some regrets about that. It just, and and she, she didn't like it being in the woods and she didn't like, you know, the solitude and being away from different friends. And, uh, you know, it just kind of all started with, we were right on the school line and she wanted to go to another school. Right. And not mm-hmm. the one she'd been attending. And, uh, she just kind of made up her mind, well, I'm going to, I'm going to live with this friend. And it just kind of, it worked through a couple of friends. There was a boyfriend there. She was with, with his family at one time. And they really what, I obviously did not like that, okay, and was against it. But there's really nothing you can do to stop someone at that age. Well, she's almost 18, and as you said, you know, she's she's a very capable young woman who was determined to make her own way. Mm -hmm. So this, oh, one quick question. How does one generate power in the woods? (laughs) Kristen and I can see each other. We both looked at each other. Okay, so how do you generate power in the woods? Well, we had uh, we had a solar bank, and uh, then we also had a uh, small stream outside the house, and we ran what was called a uh, a micro turbine. So it's basically you generate electricity uh, out of that water supply, right? And and that charges a battery bank that you have, and then there's uh, an object called an inverter, and that converts everything from a twelve volt system and your solar panels and your uh, your turbine into household electricity. Got it. No, it just requires a lot of, I mean, you have to set your house up that way, you know, very low volt, low voltage type usage. There's a, you know, we had propane kind of as a backup and for heat when and we weren't using a wood stove and it just involves a lot of like minor changes that you set up to set your lifestyle up for that sort of a situation. So you were doing the tiny house thing before they were even calling them tiny houses. Well, they were, it, it was bigger than a tiny house, but it was still small. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Probably about uh, you know, 900 square feet house. When Brianna was living at home then, who who else was there? It was yourself, uh, your ex-wife. Myself and my, and, and my ex-wife. And no other kids? Just My, the- my son was there uh, initially when we first lived there, but then uh, he, he's, uh, he's uh, four years older. Got it. And so mm-hmm. he was he was actually living uh, you know down closer where his work was, which was closer to Burlington at the time, mm-hmm. around a plate. And then uh, he did actually, we had another place on another house. There was another house on the property and uh, he, he eventually moved in there some too. So, right. But for two young people who were 17 and 21, give or take at that time, the sustainable living in the woods lifestyle wasn't all that appealing to them. Yes. I think I get it because when you're in your late teens or early twenties, I think it's a lot more about your friends and your social life and Uh going out with, with your pals and, and those kind of things than it would be living with mom and dad in a, in a beautiful house in, in uh, a mile down the road from civilization to put it mildly. 
Yeah, well, I, that's the age group I work with. You've got it spot on right there for sure. So, Bruce, at what point did the Vermont State Police actually, assuming it was a runaway case, and actually look at it as a missing persons case? I think they got serious about it, actually, probably about two weeks in. We had, you know, nobody had heard anything. We had a uh, an organization it's called the Class Kids uh, Search Center uh, contacted me, and they offered to help organize the search. And they were really good at media and promoting this, you know, that sort of end and part of the organization factor. So at that point, it kind of hit the media. And then, you know, it seemed like it all happened at the same time. It hit the media, and then they were really serious about, uh, they got pretty serious about it at that point. And they had to, because there was a lot of pressure there on them. And how was the media coverage helpful in terms of changing the circumstances of how Vermont State Police approached the case? Well, that's, they just felt the media, the media pressure. I think once the search came, it was like, well, this isn't a runaway. And they did a little bit of their own fact finding at that point. And, and it just kind of, I guess it just kind of came together organically. It, it seemed like that, that portion of it happened you know, all at the same time. And had Brianna ever gone long periods of time without talking to to you and her mom? Uh, no. I mean, we would see her a couple of times a week, um, maybe more, maybe a little less, but, you know, in a regular sense, sure. Right. For her to go two weeks without communicating with the rest of the family was extremely unusual. Am I correct? Yes. So... What was your impression then of the Vermont State Police investigation? Well, there was just a, a lot of kind of circumstances at that time. I, I was really so mad at him at that point. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, things changed, but there was, there was a lot of things that happened. It, it kind of a backstory is uh, she disappeared on a Friday night. Now, the car was registered to her mom. Right. And uh, so the police found the car on a Saturday morning. And uh, for some reason, I, I really at this point, I've never had a good, good explanation of it. But uh, he just he made the assumption. I was told later, all oh, this was a drunk driver. And, and the excuse was, well, we get them all the time. People just, you know, they get drunk, they wreck the cars and then they run away. Right. And they're embarrassed. The they're embarrassed and the whole thing. And I, sure. I think I get that part. Friday night. I, car smacked yeah, into the old house. Yeah, I get house. the point, but, you know, anyone that's kind of looked at that thing with any sense of, uh, you know, you'd think they, you, I'm just saying, you know, from, from real quick, you, you hearing the explanation, you've already picked up on the point that, hey, this is, this is kind of unusual and not, uh, but anyhow, to make, to make a long story short, uh, the police found the paychecks. Brandon had left her paychecks were actually still in the car on the front seat. I, I find, and, uh, I find that very odd as well. Yes. That always stuck out for me. Yes. Yes. And so I guess, uh, uh, he just made a phone call to the local towing service and he had the car towed. I guess he snapped a few pictures and had the car towed. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then because it was a Saturday and his shift was done for the week, he never actually came back at the end of his shift and filed all the reports and, and, you know, he never contacted us, even though the car was registered in our name. You kind of, and, we're both kind of shaking our heads here. I mean, not even a phone call to say, nothing. hey, we found your car. We wanted to make sure you were okay. In other words, I guess the assumption at the beginning was, okay, drunk driver smacked into the house going backwards at a high rate of speed. Although, as I said, even when you look at the photographs, it doesn't look like a traffic accident. Although I guess people have done lots of dumb things while drunk driving. What's odd then is, so are they letting days go by without even reaching out to the registered owner of the vehicle? That's right. That's right. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is this is not getting off to a good start, no, is it? It just, it just and it just kind of went downhill from there. I think she was staying with a, a, a girlfriend of hers. And the girlfriend, you know, this is circumstance, the girlfriend happened to have been gone for the weekend also. Oh, that's un okay. that's unfortunate, but that, that yeah. does So the happen. girlfriend calls us at the beginning of the following week and says, hey, have you seen Brianna? Because Brianna left me a note that said she'd be home after right. work on that Friday night. And, uh, you know, she's obviously never came home. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. 
One of the most frequent questions we're asked here at Mind Over Murder is, how can I help? Thanks to Othram, a leading forensic DNA testing lab for law enforcement, you can get involved and help solve real cases. If you have tested at a consumer genetics company, you can contribute your data to dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just two simple steps. Your DNA might be the missing piece that helps solve the identity of an unknown person. Then Mind Over Murder will highlight cases Othram is working on to seek your crowdfunding support for DNA testing to help solve these cold cases. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. It's easy, free, and confidential. Then join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Othram and dnasolves.com. In these stressful times, everyone needs some time to chill out and relax. That's why we're excited to announce this week's sponsor, Boston Green Health. Boston Green Health is a local provider of CBD products that specializes in oils, topicals, gummies, and edibles. Boston Green Health's plant-based products can provide natural relief and rest for the mind, body, and soul. As one of New England's premier hemp-based companies, they offer a variety of all-natural CBD products that use a blend of locally sourced hemp extract. Visit bostongreenhealth.com for premium CBD oil, a delicious variety of CBD-infused gummies, luxurious handcrafted topicals, and a product line for pets. Mind Over Murder listeners can receive 20% off any purchase by using show code MOM20. Boston Green Health takes pride in being New England's most trusted CBD brand. Visit bostongreenhealth.com and use show code MOM20 for 20% off any purchase. Do you like our show, Mind Over Murder, and want to create your own podcast? Well then, let us tell you about Anchor. First of all, it's free. And who doesn't love free, right? I like free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more platforms. And you can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I like the sound of that. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Right here, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started on your own podcast. You can tell them Kristen and Bill from Mind Over Murder sent you. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. So we start calling around Brianna's friends that we knew and trying to find out where. And at this point, I mean, you're concerned. But at this point, you know, I have to admit, I mean, I didn't know anything about the car. I didn't know anything about where it was found. All we know that she didn't come home. So we still think her her and her car are somewhere. Are together. Oh, I get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, when we found out that uh, nobody knew where she was, uh, we went down to the state police barracks and uh, to put in a missing persons report. And then the actually the the officer that had had the car towed was there and he called us back into the office and he pulled out pic- a picture that he had taken before he had the car towed. Right. And said, you know, is this your car? And, you know, about that time, you know, all hell broke loose. Yeah, because all of a sudden now it's all coming together. Not only have we not heard from Brianna in what we're talking about, like four or five days now. Yes. And then he pulls out a picture and you and your ex-wife say that's our car yeah oh man wow. so now i guess lights are starting to go on over ev- everyone's head i'm not criticizing anybody some of it i think it's just the circumstances so when you say all hell broke loose what did they say well they told us what they told us what they knew had happened he said well you know i had the car towed and uh that was it was like well where you know where where did you have it towed to and and then he told us and uh you know, it was just, we filed the report and it, things are a little foggy for me there. Oh, some un- of this, okay. Yeah. You know, Understood. I mean, it it's also because you're just, you're emotionally, you go into that point, you're kind of going crazy. Right. And so, you know, I mean, I asked him, oh, I think I remember asking during the point of it is, uh, you know, 
you know, had he checked the car out? And, you know, I looked in the car and did you look in the trunk? And, you know, he said, no, because I don't have any keys. And so, you know, that's the first thing I did is, you know, I, I called my son and, and we ran up to where the car was. And that, that was the first thing is, you know, we just pried open the trunk because that was my fear that somehow she was in the trunk because no right. one had ever looked. Right. You know? and that right. was one of the hardest things in my life, you know, Yeah. Uh, of getting that trunk open and finding out that, you know, I guess, thank God she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. And at some point, did they begin to secure the car and start taking a harder look at what's inside the car and, you know, begin to work, yes. work yes. the case from a forensic standpoint? Yes. They had the car towed from that lot and down to the police barracks at that point. And then they started to actually do some kind of basic ground investigation. But there was just, you know, things that happened. I didn't wait for them at that point. I mean, we, my son and I, and I myself, we just, we did what we could right then and there because we weren't waiting for them. Right. We went to the Black Lantern. We went to our friends. We went, you know, anywhere we could think of, of anybody that might knew anything. Right. And you're and, also uh, letting people know, look, she's definitely missing at this point. And some of these right. people might not you know, even and, have realized that. Right. Exactly. And we started to put up posters and, you know, everything that goes with that, you know, so that, that was a, that was a, just a terrible, terrible week. Mm -hmm. Help us out with the geography a little bit. How far was your home from where Brianna was living and working at the Black Lantern? What's the distance? Just ball, uh, ballpark. Probably the ballpark, I would say 15 miles. In terms of law enforcement for these small, beautiful rural towns in Vermont, there's no local law enforcement. Am I correct? That's correct. That's uh all the all the local towns, uh, the way that's set up is there. The state police monitor county wise or multiple counties from each barracks. Mm -hmm. So, and and that was you know twenty twenty plus miles away was where the barracks was, and and they have two counties that they monitor with a little tiny force. Right. I'm not implying a criticism here. I actually live in a similar setup here in the northwest corner of Connecticut. We're in the kind of the rural corner of the state. They're covering a very broad geographic area from a single barracks. That's correct. So how big was the staff? I mean, what was your sense? Did they have people that could begin working Brianna's disappearance right away? Uh, yeah, they didn't have any they didn't have any real investigators there, I think, on staff. Wow. That was probably directed from the main, you know, kind of the main office at the time. Which so, is uh, the where, stat, the investigation was handled by the local lieutenant at the at the barracks. Are any of the original investigators still on the case and actively looking into this? No, none of the invest the original investigators are on the case. So, in terms of moving, actually moving the investigation forward and conducting forensic examination of the car and going back to where the car was originally found, which may have been a crime scene. Who was doing that kind of work? They assigned a uh, a sergeant who I, I'm not sure whether she had any investigating, you know, special investigating abilities, but they assigned a sergeant to the case. And then, uh, you know, she reported back to the lieutenant. And so they did begin, you know, they went back to the scene over a period of uh, and, and there's where my time does start to get a little messed up in memory wise, but you know, they, they did, you know, they did go over the scene, you know, they did bring dogs out to the scene and, you know, they did start some basic, basic investigations as far as, you know, they kind of went back to the black lantern and, and just kind of went through and, and they, you know, they, they went at us pretty hard too, particularly me. So, um, yeah. So they did start to do something. And that initial rush of energy and activity that you felt, were you able to continue pushing the the investigation forward from a from a father son perspective? Yes, I mean I I I, I mean I'm self employed, uh, kind of always have been for years and years and years, and so I essentially just shut work off and, and devoted my you know my entire life to you know in between the time I was doing my own investigation and uh then going down and meeting and expecting results and you know expecting things to be shared and it just 
quite frankly, those those meetings turned in degenerated into yelling and screaming matches. Wow. Well, yeah. you know, <laughs> my family's been through some of this in the Colonial Parkway murders, and uh, it's 34 years to the day today on the day we're taping this program. So we have some sense of what you might have gone through. What were you expressing in the, you know, when things got to the place where you were yelling, what was causing you to make those observations? You were dissatisfied with the status of the investigation? Oh, sure. For sure. And and also they were upset with me for uh, for actually, you know, doing doing my own efforts to try to find her. So, you know, I they you know, at one point he threatened to arrest me for interfering with the investigation. Oh, I love this one. This is one of my favorites. I basically told him, go ahead, because I, you know, the minute I, you know, get done with this arrest, you know, I'm going to go straight to the news media with it. Yeah. You know, it, uh, tell me, so I didn't get arrested, but things, (laughs) things got about as far as, as far down as, as things could go. What exactly were they going to arrest you for Bruce being the father of a missing girl who was upset and concerned? Well, I don't know. You know, I was talking to people that they didn't want me talking to, and and, uh, I was kind of stirring things up quite a bit. Was the media helpful to you at that point? Were you able to use the media effectively to to shine that spotlight on Brianna's case? Uh, Yes, I, I actually think they were. And I got, I got a little bit of a learning curve that I learned to uh, to use the media myself. And uh, it's certainly, you know, I, I found out they will respond to media pressure. Oh, absolutely. It's a yeah. very, very effective tool. As a matter of fact, and I know you've worked with a number of families of other missing and murdered people through your private investigations for the missing organization. That's actually one of the things that I've coached people on is using the media more effectively because it can be incredibly helpful and important when you're trying to get the word out. Yeah. Quite frankly, your investigators' priorities and even their media approach might not necessarily line up with a family or a concerned father's right. point of view on a missing persons case. But the, but to treat the state police, in, in all fairness, now that that was at the very beginning. That period of time kind of culminated, and we had a I had a fairly large meeting with some uh, higher ups of the state police were there, and the barracks uh, lieutenant was there, and the FBI was there, and that descended into a yelling, screaming match, and starting across the table, and all that kind of stuff. I, I will say that was kind of the low point, and they got rid of the l- lieutenant that was at the barracks, transferred him out, and they brought in another guy who who was just a, a lot better guy. And uh, you know, he's he's he really started and made an effort to kind of work with the family, and he kind of ramped things up, and things got a little better from that point, and just just to like knock it all off in in a short amount of time. But uh, he transferred out. And then they brought in a, a third investigator or a third commander there at the, the barracks. And that guy was a, it was a man named Glenn Hall. Glenn and I actually, you know, well, at the beginning, things were a little rocky, too, with him and me. But I developed a really good working relationship with him. And he was very informative. And, and we just kind of started to learn, or at least I did. We, we, we learned to work together. And uh kind of fast forward to 2006, you know, I, I had sent a letter to the commander, uh, the state police at the time, and I just kind of went through all the early complaints and, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the problems and issues. And I, I'd moved to New York State by then, and that commander re- responded, and he came over along with uh, his second in command and a few of the investigators, and we sat down at the table, and, and we really kind of hashed through that and uh the whole kind of all that had happened in the whole cases and they came as close to an apology as they could ever ever come yeah law enforcement's uh, not big on ever saying they're sorry uh, yeah it, it got as close as uh, as close as what i was you know kind of going to get right <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're they're very big on never saying they're sorry never admitting a mistake at least in right. in Uh, my personal experience. I've actually had yelling matches with the FBI about this because I've said, how come you guys are completely incapable of saying you're sorry or that you made a mistake? I said, I do it every day (laughs) in my personal life and in my business. 
nobody would ever be able to go through life without ever admitting fault or ever apologizing, as near as I can tell, except for law enforcement. <laughs> the commander at that time was a man named James Baker. And uh, after that meeting, uh, we we had a, another talk and they really they've made some serious changes. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They uh, you know, he he put two of his investigators on it essentially as their primary job to investigate this case and make sure it gets organized because there was holes all the way through it. And one of my big complaints is, you know, that you have a lieutenant here and, uh, you know, you now I get another guy and I get another guy and he doesn't know what's going on. And, it, you know, he's got to get up to speed and it just so they, they responded to a lot of my complaints and uh, they put these two guys on it and, and they worked it pretty good for a year. And uh, which is uh, a step in the right direction, it sounds like. Absolutely. And then uh, uh, he was replaced by uh, a guy named Tom Lesperance, who I had a really good working relationship and I could go to him directly. And as a matter of fact, he actually promoted that. You know, he he was the head of the Vermont State Police at the time. And we had fairly regular meetings and personal meetings and we would have breakfast and and we'd talk about some things. And when I asked him and stuff that I said was important to me, you know, he, he really tried to get get done. And both of those guys are on the board of the private investigations for the mission. Oh, actually. wow. So, so you ended up in a better place with some of the key players. Absolutely. And they changed a lot of their formats. They, they instigated or uh, uh, instigated is not the word. Uh, they had no Amber alert system. Uh, oh, really? they, ha they had no uh, missing, uh, missing persons uh, site. Oh. There was just so much of the stuff that, you know, that kind of came about. Uh, as the result of everything that they went through and I went through with Brianna, they really updated that. They actually changed their whole format of investigations. Now they have a, uh, a major crimes uh, unit. So now no matter what happens in the state, their best people go out and work that major crime. They have a number of people. So they have like a team that they put together to do that. And it was a way of working through these like rural areas where, you know, heck, most of the time nothing happens. But when something does happen, it's not left up to the barracks commander anymore. So there's just a lot of really, really good things. And and, and I have a lot of good to say about them uh, kind of as the years have gone on. Mm -hmm. Well, and it sounds like they listened and learned as did you, I'm sure, about how they could do it better. Right. And Vermont's this beautiful place, and it's this, you know, incredible, bucolic, you know, wonderful state. But as you said, every once in a while, something terrible happens, and they've got to be able to address it. And it's funny, these changes that were made really do sound significant, like the problems that you experienced in the early going of Brianna's investigation probably wouldn't happen in uh, 2020 as they did in 2004. Yes, I agree. I believe, you know, I believe that entirely. And one of the things that came out as, as the, as well, it came out last night in the, in the uh, talking to the, uh, the man from the DNA uh, thing is a fact of the car. They changed that formula entirely. Uh, now they no longer ever turn cars back to the families and say, well, we're done with them. As long as it's an open case, you know, they they retain possession of uh, anything like that cars or anything else yeah. because of, you know, future DNA advancements that just weren't there and maybe coming in the future even. So, yeah, we experienced the same thing in the Colonial Parkway murders. There's four double homicides. And except in my sister's case where the car was so badly compromised, in the other three examples, they returned the cars to the families and the families didn't know what to do with them. And so ultimately exactly. the, uh, the cars, wow. the families found it very upsetting to have the cars there. And so ultimately the cars were sold, you know, often to just get rid of them. Mm -hmm. You mentioned private investigations for the missing. Can you tell us a little bit more about the organization? Sure. It, it was just an idea. I had an investigator that I, a private investigator that I started working with named Greg Overacker. And, uh, he came in probably uh, five years after it all happened, and uh, he's been with me ever since. And uh, he's just there's not enough good I can say about that man. Along the line, I mean, it, it's uh, we actually discussed it, so I don't really claim to have the idea because it kind of came out of uh, Greg and me having talks. It's like, you know, there's just people all over that need help and in 
police cases, you know, you learn through experience of this, but anybody's cases from a lot of people that I've talked to have the exact same formula. I mean, initially, there's what I call the reactive stage where, you know, the case is fresh, the police work on it, and then they, uh, and it's just universal throughout the country. It's, it's a damn shame, but it is. They get called away by the latest fresh cases, and these other cases go to the background. So that reactive stage doesn't last very long. And then uh, it just goes into a, a post stage where, yeah, they'll do a little bit. If they get something really hot, they'll do it. But they, they no longer like actively try go out and try to pursue leads and try to talk to people. And I found out through working with a private investigator that they have a lot of advantages in obtaining information over a police force because the people are much more willing to talk to them right. because they're not afraid to getting arrested or anything else like that. So a, pri- a good private investigator is a really valuable tool. And quite frankly, you know, it's, it went for years with me knowing that this was a good idea, but just not having them, you know, not having the emotional, the emotional capability to be able to kind of handle that because it, it just sort of brings back a lot of bad memories that I have to deal with. And I, I knew like a lot of that just comes and, and uh, it even does some here talking to you. And so, it, but it just came to a point where I said, you know, we, we just got to do this. There's so much need out there. So, so, uh, so I started the organization and the goal of the organization is, is really pretty simple. I mean, we try to provide investigative services at no cost to families that, you know, their cases have completely, you know, stalled, gone cold, or quite frankly, were never really investigated to start with. Depends on the, and, and it's just been slowly building as we, as we get funding, we, there's never enough funding. I, I would, I would love to be able to go nationwide. You know, I have uh, five investigators we're working with now that kind of take this on. We, we try to pay uh, what we can, but they're doing it in part as a mission themselves. And, uh, you know, we're, we're actively working some cases and making some progress. And, you know, at, at some point, those cases still have to go back to whatever police force as a jurisdiction. I mean, they're the only ones that have the, the power of the state to be able to make arrests and do what they need to do. But as, as they say, the devil's in the details. Putting this thing together, uh, you know, you start with a really simple concept, but there sure is a lot to it. Where can our listeners find some more information about this or how can they help you if they want to help out? And our, our listeners do like to get involved. So what can we do to help? Uh, the easiest way is uh, investigatingforthemissing.org, and we have a GoFundMe page or a link where you can click on and make a, a donation for that. Any size donation is, and I have a whole team of volunteers that are really internet savvy. You know, I'm told I'm on Twitter and all the stuff like that too. That <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Facebook, I'm on some of that too that I don't know anything about. Uh, but there, there's, there's way to give through all those sites. It's very easy to give if you're inclined. And, and, you know, for anybody that's interested in giving, I mean, there's there's one thing that I stress is that uh, we're not uh, one of these nonprofits where we have a lot of overhead and, and, and we're giving very little to the actual cause. Every nickel they give, because everyone is a volunteer, right. goes toward these investigators to try to help families. So essentially zero overhead and it's all going to help people in need. Essentially, yes. I mean, we have some printing costs and, you know, just different things like that. But you bet everything's going and and that's the way it runs. And how do families go about requesting your assistance? Is there a a reach out method for that? How do we go about that? Uh, For families right now, it's been uh, generally we're reacting. People uh, will email us through the website and kind of tell us their stories and, you know, want to know if we can help them. And obviously right now, uh, we can't send an investigator out because developing an investigator in all areas of the country is is difficult to do. And we also don't have enough funding right now to be be able to pay a team of investigators from every state. But what we do what we do do is is I work through Lance and Tim in the crawl space media, and what we we try to give attention to the people in any way we can to help them out. And a lot of times, uh, and, and the girls in the social media, well, you know, there's you can tell you how to print print flyers for yourself, and we also promote them through the social media. And Tim and Lance do a good job of uh, getting a lot of the people on the show and try to get uh, a little bit of of uh, 
the media attention to their cases, and then we just sit down and give them advice. I do probably like you do, Bill. Is uh, I mean, I've had families that have uh, contacted, and I've called them, and I've just kind of, from my own experiences, to just to try to help them do a lot of little things to try to like motivate law enforcement. Or sometimes it involves, you know, going and you know getting records. And there, there's things that just there's things sometimes that can be done, and the family you know, steps up and does these little things if they know what to do. Yeah, absolutely. Believe it or not, that's the end of an episode. We very much want to keep going because you're doing a fantastic job. (laughs) I think we should hit the stop button. Let us continue because you're amazing in this. You just filled up an episode. (laughs) Is it okay? Can we go again? Yeah, Yeah. we can. We can run it for a little while yet. If you have further questions, go for it now, I guess. Join us again next time as we continue our conversation with Bruce Maitland discussing his organization, Private Investigations for the Missing, and next steps in the missing persons case of his 17-year-old daughter, Brianna Maitland. Thanks for listening to Mind Over Murder. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.